graduate of the University of Mary Washington in the year 2013, where she studied International Affairs and Middle Eastern Studies. She has been featured on Fox News and NBC, as well as at, at an exhibition for the, Internet, for the National Center for Civil and Human Rights. Uh, Riham has also worked on a number of policy issues and participated in a live Google Plus Hangout with President Obama after his fifth State of the Union address. And most recently, she was seated at President Obama's table at this year's White House of Flood, where she brought up a number of issues including countering violent extremism, the media's bias, and engaging with the Muslim community. She's an advocate and a rising superstar in our community, and she's going to share some valuable insight on how to create an inclusive society. Assalamu alaikum everyone and Ramadan Kareem. Uh, Jazakallah khair Sarah for that really incredible introduction. Um, I definitely did not expect that. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you guys tonight. Uh, this is actually my first time ever doing a khatira. So when MakeSpace asked me to come and speak, you know, I really did think long and hard about, you know, what do I want to bring up? And, you know, I thought back to the last MakeSpace halakha I attended which was with Imam Suhey Webb. And I remembered something Imam Suhey Webb said that really stuck out to me. You know, he said that during Ramadan, the sinner becomes a saint. And you know, that just kept on going over and over again in my mind. You know, I thought about that. I said, you know, if during Ramadan, the sinner becomes a saint, you know, I felt like that applied to me. You know, it reminded me of, you know, it was just six Ramadans ago that, you know, I started embracing Islam, you know, all over again. I was born a Muslim, but, you know, I wasn't extremely practicing. And um, as Sarah said, you know, I went to the University of Mary Washington. And, you know, going into college, I actually tried to stay away from the Muslim Student Association on purpose. I tried my best to kind of, you know, keep undercover as a Muslim. I didn't wear the hijab at the time, so it was, it was pretty easy to kind of stay away. But eventually, you know, in typical Muslim fashion, the Muslim Student Association found a way to get me to join. And, you know, subhanAllah, that Ramadan was extremely life-changing for me. A lot of us, we come into Ramadan, you know, and we start to, you know, pray more. We start to maybe pray Fajr on time, come to Taraweeh. And then a lot of us leave Ramadan not being changed. You know, we stop doing those acts. And then, you know, those people who only come to Ramadan, who only come to Taraweeh and you know, only pray, pray during Ramadan are referred to as Ramadan Muslims. I never liked that phrase and I heard about it a couple years ago and I really hated that phrase because, you know, you're almost assuming that someone will leave Ramadan unchanged and that's not the case, you know, that's kind of being judgmental towards people because, you know, the reason I continued to, you know, practice Islam the way I did during Ramadan after Ramadan is because of, you know, my group of friends who made sure to not judge me. You know, they created a very inclusive society for me where, you know, I didn't ever feel judged and they never ever did judge me. They're very compassionate towards me and just kind of let me be who I was while still, you know, giving me, you know, masiha, giving me advice here and there. So I want to start off by um, telling a story about the Prophet I and I'm going to be drawing from the Quran and the had and hadiths um, a lot of times throughout my talk. But a story about the Prophet Sallallahu you know, where he created a truly inclusive society was, an example of that is the story of a man named Abdullah, who the Prophet Sallallahu it was a companion of his. Except Abdullah was an alcoholic. And you know, a lot of times, Abdullah would be brought to the Prophet Sallallahu drunk. And you know, people would ridicule him, people would talk about him, and the Prophet Sallallahu he never let that happen. You know, there was a time where the companion of the Prophet Sallallahu you know, said, Oh Allah, curse him about Abdullah. And the Prophet Sallallahu in response said, Do not curse him, for I swear by Allah, if you only knew just how very much indeed he loves Allah and his messenger. So the Prophet Sallallahu you know, defended him. And he focused on, you know, the amazing things that Abdullah did. He didn't focus on the fact that he was an alcoholic. You know, everyone else was, you know, talking about him behind his back. But the Prophet Sallallahu he didn't do that. So, you know, and another thing the Prophet Sallallahu didn't do is that he didn't create a divided society where it was, you know, the sinners versus the pious. There was no division like that. At least that's what he was trying to create. And I feel like that's something we can create now, you know, where we're not, you know, constantly judging those who don't appear to be on the straight path, you know, according to what we believe. Um, 
And then another thing I want to talk about is, you know, how can we apply the way the Prophet ﷺ gave advice into our life? When the Prophet ﷺ gave advice, you know, he wasn't judgmental and he was very loving. And we have to think about that, you know, when we're doing something wrong, how do we want people to give us advice? Would we, would we appreciate if someone came up to us and was extremely harsh? Or do you think, you know, if they were kind towards us, that we would more likely be, you know, be able to take their advice? And, you know, the word um, advice in Arabic is actually nasiha. And nasiha means, you know, to be pure and to refine something. So when we're giving advice, you know, we need to do it in a pure way. We need to purify our intentions, you know, when we're giving advice. We need to think, you know, am I giving someone advice for my, you know, personal ego? Am I getting something out of it? Or is this truly, you know, for the other person? And then another thing we need to do when we're giving, you know, sincere advice to someone is to be humble. You know, think about that. We need to remember that, you know, we're sinners too. And, you know, if you don't believe you're a sinner, that's a sin within itself to not believe that you're a sinner too. And to, you know, think that you're better than someone else. And, um, you know, in the Quran, Allah says, And the servants of Allah, most gracious, are those who walk on the earth in humility. So if we see a friend of ours that's doing something haram, you know, we shouldn't say astaghfirullah, why are they doing that? We need to be humble. And remember, you know, we do a lot of things too that people probably say astaghfirullah about as well. Um, and then um, this, I'm going to read a verse to you guys from the Quran that always, has always stuck out to me. And you were on the edge of a pit of the fire, and he saved you from it. Thus does Allah make clear to you his verses that you may be guided. So that verse is always, I always visualize it, you know, when you were on the edge of a pit of a fire. Like I actually imagine that in my head, that, you know, you commit a sin, and then you're on the edge of a pit of fire. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he saves you from that fire. So who are we to judge those who, you know, have one foot in the fire when we just had our foot there and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to guide us? You know, we did not guide ourselves. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to guide us. So we cannot be arrogant when we see others who have not been guided yet. And then like just on the topic of guidance, you know, we can never truly guide someone. You know, guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. So, you know, if we have our brother or a friend that we see, you know, sinning or something like that, you know, you can pray to Allah to guide him. You can offer sincere and nasiha. But in the end, you know, if that person is guided, that's because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He used us as a tool to guide that person. It's not because of us. And then lastly, you know, uh, when it comes to uh, giving sincere um, advice, we have to speak to people nicely. You know, Allah reminds us to speak to people uh, kindly in the Quran. And then Allah says, Oh, you have believed. Let not a people ridicule another people. Perhaps they may be better than them. Perhaps they may be better than them. Nor let women ridicule other women. Perhaps they may be better than them. And do not insult one another and do not call each other by offensive names. And, you know, I, I'm a communications coordinator at MPAC, and a lot of times, you know, I'm always online. I spend 99% of my time on the internet. And, you know, constantly I'm just seeing Muslims attack each other day and night online, you know, whether it's about the White House of Thought or any other uh, scenario that comes up in our community. But, you know, we have to show kindness towards one another. We can't, you know, continue to participate in this cannibalism. You know, we're eating ourselves alive and we're eating our brothers and sisters alive when we're, you know, participating in these kind of acts. So, um, another thing I want to talk about is, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we have no idea what anyone else is going through. So when we're offering advice, we need to remember that, you know, our situation may not necessarily be like someone else's situation. You know, we may have grown up in a place like uh, make space perhaps, you know, maybe we grew up in a very inclusive society where people didn't judge us, you know, maybe if you're a sister who doesn't wear the hijab, maybe if you come here, you know, and no one judges you, but you go to other mosques and people judge you. That might make you want to go away from Islam. So we have to remember that not everyone, you know, grew up in the same kind of society as we do. So we need to give people the benefit of the doubt. We need to be patient towards them. You know, take it easy. People, you know, embrace Islam at their own kind of steps. Um, another example, um, I want to tell a story about um, Umar radiallahu anhu. You know, Umar radiallahu anhu, we see him now as this, he's, he's an amazing companion, mashallah. And you know, he's promised Jannah. But you know, there was a time where Umar radiallahu anhu was, you know, he was, 
you know, acting in a certain way towards, you know, his servant who did not worship Allah. So imagine, you know, being judgmental towards Umar radiallahu anhu. You never know where someone's gonna go, you know. You might be, think you're better than someone today, but tomorrow they could be better than you. You know, you might go to sleep a believer and wake up a non-believer, and someone else can go to sleep a non-believer and wake up a believer, and then, you know, be 10 times better than you when it comes to worshiping Allah. So we have to keep those things in mind. And lastly, I just want to end with final examples of the Prophet Sallallahu that we could, you know, take home with us tonight when we're thinking about how do we want to create an inclusive society, you know, or an inclusive household, or be more inclusive towards our friends and our neighbors. The Prophet Sallallahu he never sugarcoated when he came to advice, right? Don't get me wrong, he was very kind with it, but he never took away from the truth. He was, but he was still very soft and gentle in the way he gave advice to people. The Quran testifies, it says, so by the mercy of Allah, O Muhammad, you were gentle with them. And had you been harsh or hard-hearted, they would have dispersed from around you. So pardon them and ask forgiveness for them and consult with them about matters. And then there's a hadith where it says, make matters easy and do not make them difficult and give glad tidings and do not turn people away. So I just wanted you guys to you know, reflect more on you know, these, this Quran verse and this hadith. You know, it's really beautiful when you think about it. You know, Ramadan is really a time for us to be able to put these, you know, these teachings into play. We're at Taraweeh every night. There's so many opportunities for us to practice these things I shared with you guys, with people that you're meeting every day. Just be more kind towards people. Show more compassion. And Jazakallah khair for MakeSpace. I want to end on that note. I think MakeSpace is a really amazing thing. You know, I, I didn't have a MakeSpace when I was growing up. Perhaps if I did have a MakeSpace, you know, it wouldn't have been until college that I started to, you know, re-embrace Islam. I might have started earlier. So I really encourage you guys, you know, donate to make space, whether it's five dollars or a thousand dollars, just donate what you can. We need make space. So just like a love for your time.